So welcome, and before we dive into the webinar topic today, I'd like to do a few introductions. I'm pleased to introduce Todd Kern. Todd is the Chief Marketing Officer at Front Wave Credit Union. Todd is a marketing and brand management veteran spanning the entertainment, sports, and finance industries. Karen McGahey is Strum's VP of Client Services. She is also a principal here at Strum. She has over 20 years of experience at Strum, leading strategic marketing and branding projects. We also have Josh Struffer, who is Strum's creative director. He is also a principal here at Strum. He also has 20 year, over 20 years of experience developing dozens of financial brands and names. My name is Ben Stengland. I'm the president and COO here at Strum. And today, they will be sharing their knowledge on three steps to boosting performance, supercharging your culture, and investing in what customers crave. To get us started, I'm handing the presentation over to Karen. All right, thank you, Ben. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So why does brand matter more now than ever? Well, um, let's reflect on the past eight months. It's been pretty tough on many people and businesses. And for some, it's been really rapid fire lessons in crisis management requiring really an, an, an unimaginable speed of business adaptation and change um, to serve customers. And while for many banking operations were extremely challenged initially to fulfill those customer needs through almost entirely digital channels, many brands were also caught off guard, unsure how to respond during this historic um, unrest and many organizations also discovered that their brands were really ill prepared to weather the storm. So how does a financial institution evolve its brand? Well, first you must begin with examining the future relevance of your organization's purpose and brand based on the forever impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we put this little slide together just to remind us all. Uh, you know, up until February last year, things were pretty normal. Uh, March started, we thought, okay, there'll be a return to normal. Uh, then we were on to, okay, well, maybe this is the new normal. There's a, uh, a group called the Cross Innovation Strategy Group. It was uh, sponsored by, uh, by NASA, and they wrote a paper called uh, Never Normal, which uh, is worth a read. And, um, and basically, it's like, oh, gosh, we just have to recognize that things are constantly shifting and you know no end in sight sounds a little bleak but what we have here is an opportunity for constant innovation what we know is that you know this the, the month or so we're in now is very different than a few months ago a few months from now will be uh, different than it is today and so innovation is more important than ever uh, thinking about what really matters strategy uh, and being able to adapt uh, is, is more important than ever because we are certainly all on the same uh, Corona coaster. Yeah, and I think uh, for us at Front Wave, we've definitely been on the Corona coaster. It's, as as uh, Karen said, it's been uh, an eight month ride where uncertainties really ruled the day uh, and where each day's looked radically different than the day before which has been true in our lives, our culture, heck, even our politics, and especially in our businesses. We're continuously tasked to perform in uncharted territory with really uh, unsure footing. And what I keep saying is the struggle's real. Uh, it's been a juggling act to make sure that we're innovating and differentiating while trying to wrap our heads around adapting and pivoting to the new world of the new normal or never normal. Uh, meanwhile, as marketers, our day-to-day, -day, we have to make real-time decisions on branding, messaging, media spend, production numbers, and manage the funnel the whole time, all while trying to get a handle on how consumers and the market are handling it all and taking it all in. And I can tell you, it's really great to have a solidified brand as a North, uh, North Star to help guide you. Yeah. And I think one really important piece for all of us as, as branders and marketers to think about is, is effective branding. Good branding has always been about fulfilling need, um, uh, practical need, but also emotional need. And so I've been thinking a lot about Maslow's hierarchy 
Uh, probably most of us are familiar with this. And basically, you know, we have our basic needs at the bottom, food, water, then we move on to security, then relationships, esteem, self-actualization. What I think is really critical um, uh, for all of us, our staff, the people we're serving, the communities we're doing business with, everybody is on unsure footing. A lot of us have slipped a step. We might have gone one level down on this pyramid of self-actualization. And where people are hurting and where people are feeling and where people are worried, it's kind of in those yellow and green levels. And when we think about safety needs, that includes financial security. It includes um, uh, your, your wealth and your money and, and all of that. And so a kind of thinking about our, our brands and adapting them to that yellow and green space, this is the practical stuff of how we help you, but also you belong. Uh, we're here, we understand you. Um, and tuning the brands to really, really uh, address those parts of the of Maslow's uh, uh, pyramid. Yeah, Josh, we, we had talked real quick when we were first talking about this, we were looking at that and saying, hey, where did the front wave brand kind of fit in? And uh, two schools of thought came in. The first thing I thought was, oh my gosh, if this happened to front wave five years ago, uh, I'm not sure what would have happened because we might have been caught flat footed and not sure that our cultural readiness was there. Um, I, I later asked uh, some of our executives, hey, if this happened five years ago, would we've been ready? And I got a resounding, mm, I'm not sure. Um, so I think the good thing about having that brand, and we live in that yellow kind of belongingness space, and the, the great thing about uh, our brand was we never wavered, we leaned in, uh, because when we say, hey, we're fighters, we make financial dreams come true, uh, that really helped us and helped us during the process to make sure, hey, we have to deliver, we have to pivot quickly and make sure members are taken care of so that they really do have that sense of belongingness and, and part of that crew. All right, great. That's a good segue for where we're headed, Todd. Thank you. Um, so to frame the discussion today, we've broken it into three parts. So we're gonna discuss culture, purpose, and loyalty, and we'll examine each part for its significance and its role in uh, boosting the performance of your brand. So let's get started with culture and uh, its influence and how it impacts your brand. So culture is rooted in what it is that you value as an organization. And values really define your beliefs and reveal what's important not only to the company, but also its employees and also the customers who, who choose you as a preferred brand. Um, they also influence the actions of your brand. And for consumers, those shared values are also those tipping points for their brand decision making. Uh, we've learned that it is vital that rebranding processes explore and discover whether or not an organization's values, mission, and vision are outdated, maybe uninspiring, or no longer reflect where executives want to lead the company. And more often, we discover that these guiding principles have been reduced to relics that simply hang on the wall and the brand's purpose and its meaning um, is held really in the hearts and the minds of the people that work there and are largely influenced, however, by the culture and the time in which they were hired. So this results in misalignment and no shared purpose. So if you're an organization that does not have your core values as a focal point um, and is driving decision-making in important areas, such as recruiting the right people um, and are not boldly shared externally in the market, this may be a sign that your culture and therefore your brand are adrift. Yeah, and uh, Peter Drucker famously said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Well, I know having done this a, a few times in a couple different industries, I'm a firm believer that a, a strong differentiated brand that's tied to your culture uh, really becomes your best weapon for success. And I know for some of you, 
I, I, you know, this is from my childhood, but sometimes it feels like culture, uh, this photo here of rock'em sock'em robots and you're kind of, your culture's fighting itself. But I would say, don't worry, we've all been there uh, one time or another. Just, it just means that you may not truly be focused. Again, like Karen said, be focused on your purpose, your overriding purpose, your brand will follow and tie those together. Um, again, having done this at multiple companies over the years, uh, a brand doesn't happen overnight and got to be done with purpose and mission. And when you start out, you know, I think this is a good visual representation of kind of the process that you go through uh, during your brand journey. And I can tell you at Front Wave Credit Union, this is where we were in 2016. We had found that our culture had been changing, but our brand hadn't. Uh, in fact, we had a 2016 internal staff survey, uh, part of our strategic planning process, where marketing and branding were identified as two of our bottom three capabilities in the credit union. So we knew something had to change. Uh, and if you feel like you're, like you're there, and I'm telling you, you typically know it, um, it's really a sign to focus on your brand. Um, one of the real keys I think that we went through at a, uh, uh, at a previous credit union that I've been to was you really know when your brand, you have brand uncertainty, when you're going through the interview process and the first question they ask is, what's wrong with our marketing? Um, so the good news is, is that companies that transform and go on this journey, they're typically clamoring for change and that makes your journey easier. So step one, you have to go on the journey. As you move from brand uncertainty towards what I call breaking the chains, this is what you going through your brand discovery. You're undergoing the journey. You're finding deeper learnings about the organization. Uh, you learn a lot about the history. I'm a, I'm a big believer in tying to your history. Um, but you also start learning how to craft your story. Uh, try to integrate your purpose. Make sure you better understand your core customer segments. Um, how your operation works, your brand begins to take shape, you start seeing those transformational changes begin, you start gaining some market distinction. I think market distinction is key. You must know your competitive set. Um, you start to resonate in, mar in market with your customers and the organization starts to come together see those arrows as the organization coming together for a common purpose. Um, if you're really good and you really continue on that journey, you start rallying the troops. And we're somewhere between breaking the chains and rallying the troops right now at Front Wave because we're now starting to see where we're getting organizational growth, customer experience improvements are beginning, um, the organization is beginning to more authentically be able to make not only key decisions, but also day-to-day -day decisions. But as you're defining your brand, it's paramount, and Karen said it earlier, you must align closely with your mission, vision, values in order to help use that brand as a weapon to shape your culture. And in effect, that way your principles, your purpose, your strategy become your North Star. They help your decision making, everyday actions and organization or and organizational growth in the organization can grow so that you can get to the holy grail of living the brand. And that's where brand and culture unite. Uh, it, it's the holy grail. It's a wonderful thing when it happens. Um, you feel it in market, you see the results. I know uh, when I was at Elevations Credit Union, you could really see that effect grow. Uh, and when we got here, you, we got that asset growth to three times capital, two times capital in a five year period. And everybody's on that mission. This is the holy grail. Uh, it, it, it's hard to get to once you achieve it. The real thing to know is you're never done. Uh, you have to continually measure your brand, watch your results and keep the process moving forward. And I think 
where we are today, the, I think this is a good representation where brand is driven culture, where we've moved from reflex driven to an action driven as we get closer to being really truly purpose driven where brand and our mission vision values are North Star uh, day to day. All right, so how do financial leaders then create a company culture, um, one that supports and reflects a set of values that aligns with their brand vision? Well, it really begins with first uncovering who you are today and then defining uh, what you want your brand to be in the future using a well-guided process. And uh, this is one that really requires bringing executives and cross-functional teams from all levels of the organization together uh, to engage in a deep collaborative process to discover the organization's strengths, uh, where the misalignment might be, um, but also uncover the opportunities to position the brand for future growth and relevancy. And that is first with your employees, um, but also your targeted audiences. Okay, <clears throat> so let's, uh... Let's talk about purpose and how we can use it uh, to differentiate ourselves and, and to tell our story. This is the point um, in a presentation where when you talk about differentiation, the agency will probably show you a picture of an umbrella in like a sea of other umbrellas. Um, ideally, that, that umbrella is like brightly colored um, to really make that point about differentiation. If, and if umbrellas aren't your thing, you can do it with eggs. Um, balloons work well. Um, people like to see balloons when they're talking about differentiation. Um, smiley faces are good. Uh, people, uh, there's um, uh, colored pencils, if colored pencils are your thing. Um, the point is an agency shows you a stock photo of something looking different mixed in with other things, right? Um, and that suggests that differentiation is, is, is simple, but it's not that simple. It really isn't but then again, it kind of is. Now, creative guys will say, well, better creativity will um, yield better results because you know, creative people like creative stuff. Um, and that's kind of true, I think that's fairly true. But when we think about how do we differentiate as financial institutions, um, um, what do we use as the means for our differentiation? There's kind of two paths that, um, that we go, and I, I put a little visual metaphor um, um, together here. Uh, path number one is differentiation based on what, what you do. And this one is probably for financial institutions, the one that most financial institutions follow. The problem, of course, is that we are 95 plus percent the same. Checking accounts and auto loans and home loans. And sometimes we say, well, our service is really what's different. But lots of good service examples out there too. So differentiating based on that, what you do, it's a little bit hard to really stand out in the eyes of the consumer um, because of that similarity. Um, very difficult and can in some cases lead to unhealthy outcomes. Um, you might find yourself locked into uh, rate-driven uh, places where you need, you need rates in order to uh, get the volume you need. So uh, path number one, difficult to differentiate. Path number two is a little bit different and that's differentiation based on your purpose. Um, um, uh, using your values, your philosophy, uh, those things that you care about and are driven towards and use that as the point of differentiation. And because uh, your purpose has so much more possibilities from one organization to another, from one community to another, uh, from one niche to another, then, then, then we open up all these options that we don't have when we're thinking about the products and the service related to that product. All right? So what is the purpose and how do we find it um, in the context of what we're talking about here? You know, Karen talked about values and culture, talked about um, you know, the things that are important to your organization. I think purpose is also rooted in what the audience needs. We talked about Maslow's pyramid earlier on. Um, you might uh, find you're serving a niche and that niche thinks a certain way. 
you might understand them and know them. And, and so when you marry your values against what they need, um, and in the context of your vision for your organization, your goals and things you want to achieve and how you want to serve, in the middle of that intersection is where the purpose lives. And that was really key to the strategy um, and the development of, of, of Frontwave's brand. Todd? Yeah, th thanks, Josh. Uh, you know, we worked uh, pretty diligently with a lot of, we had significant market and internal research. And I think one of the things is we were Pacific Marine Credit Union. We obviously changed our name, but we came to the conclusion that our name was hindering our growth in the community. And it wasn't really tied to the new culture change that I was telling you about. And in the process, uh, what we, we felt that we could better serve our proud history with the Marines while telling the community we're open, uh, that we were open for business. Uh, that, was, that was confusing in the market. Um, but I think through the process, we changed our name and brand to one that transcended uh, industry products and service, was inclusive of our Marine roots, our coastal communities, uh, as well as our desert, desert presence. And we focused on that purpose of being fighters, that not only our Marines were fighters, uh, that unique geography in Northern San Diego from the coast to the desert, we were fighters, that there was a little blue collar soul in there and that our purpose was to help make financial dreams come true for our members, for the communities we serve, and that whether they were starting up or moving out, that we're determined to help them pursue their goals and make them happen. So in the process, our brand, and we'll show you a video here that we think really serves us and communicates our purpose in an unvarnished and authentic way that really differenti differentiates ourselves from a crowded and competitive market. So if you guys wanna play the video, There aren't many communities like this one. One foot in the Pacific, the other in the desert. Home to the world's greatest fighting forces and a community of regular people fighting every day for their families, their friends, the place they call home. Working to carve out a better life for themselves in a patch of California that's more focused on authenticity than image, more substance than show. Our members spend their days working, and their free time playing. They plan, they grow, they fight for what's important, and when they bank, they bank here. Not just because of low loan rates or low fees. They bank here because we help them get stuff done. We help make things possible. It's a philosophy that was forged in 1952. Camp Pendleton, where our credit union was formed with a mission to serve Marines, their families, their community. Seven decades later, and we're still growing strong. It comes from dedication, commitment, courage, service to those who count on you. We do it with 100% commitment and zero excuses. We're the place to get started and the place to kick it into high gear, to launch something great and to pursue big goals. We're for the trailblazers and the thrill seekers, the craftsmen and the tastemakers, those dedicated to country and community, family and friends. So to all we serve, we say, dream big. We got you. We're Front Wave Credit Union, and we fight for our members. Thanks, guys. I think that gives you a real true flavor uh, with a real strong voice and a point of view on, on the purpose and why we exist. Again, making financial dreams come true. Uh, for us, the mission and the attitude come first. Products and services, yeah, we got them. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we connected to the community. We've got a really unique uh, demographic here in, in, in northern San Diego, Riverside County. Uh, as you can tell, uh, it leads us to making decisions like, hey, let's put a team store in our, in our branch. 
it, it, this is, shows you a little bit of our environment plus some of our other peripheral collateral digital marketing. But yeah, we sell t-shirts and hats. Uh, we sell uh, wine glasses and bottle openers uh, in, in our branches, but yet all the proceeds uh, go, go, go to nonprofit organizations within our community. Uh, some of the environments with skateboards and surfboards, and we get constantly get people in, in the community at events going, dude, I love you guys. How do I get one of those skateboards or surfboards? It just has an emotional connection and it connects to the community, giving that sense of belonging right? Transcending the idea of what a, what a financial brand could really be. And it really focuses on the lifestyle of who our folks are. And this is, again, from our branches. It's a call to arms for everyone in our community trying to make sure that that brand's relevant. It's authentic, it's fun, but it's also down to business. Uh, we want to make sure that when people are are talking about us. They talk about us on a Friday night with their friends, a craft brew in their hand, and they're telling them, hey, you need a loan? I got a guy. Go down there. Yeah, and I, I think the only thing I'll add to that, Todd, is that um, the, the audience, the, the staff of FrontWave is as important as the community around FrontWave. And so, when that video that we watched was written as much about setting what the cultural rules are for the future for the staff as equally with the, uh, the, the community serving. Yeah, I, exactly right. Well said, Josh. So um, a lot of bold storytelling and a bold voice um, there for, uh, for Frontwave. Um, Thought it'd be nice here to insert some tips for, for bold storytelling. And uh, some of these uh, aren't really tips, but I think they'll help you anyway. And I'm gonna put them all for organizational purposes, we'll call them tips. All right. Um, first one is, a, is just an acknowledgement. The middle is crowded, but it feels safe. So a lot of us are gonna be drawn uh, to, to put something right over the plate, right? Um, the big challenge, of course, is that there may not be room for you in there. And it's very, very hard to, to stand out. And so in order to stand out, in order to differentiate, you might have to leave the middle and go to some area that maybe feels a little more vulnerable. Now, I don't wanna tell you that you can't be successful in the middle. Um, it happens, but there aren't, um, there isn't that room for that much success because it's so crowded. So there's only one Tom Hanks. And what do I, what do I mean by that? Um, I mean that, uh, that great success is possible, as I was saying, but it's really hard for like an actor to out Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks, or for, you know, a, a, a social media company to out Facebook, Facebook or for you to out Bank of America, Bank of America. Um, so don't try, it's probably the better strategy. Um, when you tell stories, frame those stories around your purpose. And so if, cause you're gonna, we all, we gotta, we gotta write stuff and, 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 and market around auto loans and home loans and checking accounts and credit cards and all of those things that we need to do but they can all be framed around the reason we do them. And so if Todd and Frontwave have a, a purpose of fighting and make, making dreams happen, being dream makers and fighters, then when we tell a story about credit cards, we tell a story in the context of that purpose. If we talk about home loans, we talk about uh, the fight to get there. And that, um, that lens can be applied to whatever that purpose is, whatever it's defined for you. Tip number four is be brave. Um, you know, I, I, I think trying things, daring things, knowing that you're going to fail sometimes, learning from it, and then trying something else is how we innovate. Um, and the stuff that's really, really successful is probably a little, little riskier. 
And so getting, getting used to that. Aim for the edges. And what do we mean by that? Like uh, you throw it right over the plate. You put a concept right over the, the expect, expected plate. It's probably going to work. We're probably drawn to that. It's less uh, objectionable. Everyone can agree it's okay. But, the, but we want fanatics when we build brands. We want somebody to love it, um, to tell their friends how much they love it. And those fanatics aren't in the middle, they're on the edge. And think a little bit about um, Hamilton, for instance. Uh, imagine if Hamilton was uh, developed with an all white cast singing traditional music a lot safer, um, certainly uh, certainly, if you, you could make an, a logical argument if you were being pitched Hamilton, like, well, if that's um, uh, hip hop and the founding fathers, somebody might be offended, let's, let's, let's not. And I wonder to challenge yourself, how many of us would have greenlit this, would have said, okay, let's, let's put a million dollars into it. And yet because of the hip hop and because of the mixed cast, because of the, the reinterpretation of this story, we, so many more people said, oh, no musicals were talking to me before. Um, there wasn't a place for me. And now all that leads to thousand dollar tickets. So the mainstream success came from the fringe approach. And then final tip, we talk about this at Strum all the time, um, especially in the creative department, but everywhere, is you gotta embrace that knot in your stomach. When you're doing work and you're trying new things, you better be nervous. You better, you know, maybe you want to puke a little. That's maybe okay. You want to get like really, really used to being uncomfortable because that knot in your stomach means you're growing and it means you're learning and it means you're doing something new. And if you don't have a knot in your stomach, if you're not a little bit nervous, then you're probably not learning and you're probably not innovating and you're probably not differentiating. And that's just sort of a, um, a trust your gut uh, uh, PSA <laughs> there. So all of this, the, uh, the, the purpose and the storytelling and the focus is really all about finding resonance with an audience, um, about, about creating that strong uh, interplay between what the, the, the person we're trying to communicate, what they need emotionally and practically, and what we can provide, and, and wrapping that all together, which really is, um, is the point, and that leads us to loyalty. All right, so loyalty um, is about really the active engineering of experience so that uh, your brand is resonating with the audiences in which you um, seek to attract and uh, brand loyalty is earned um, and it's reinforced by branding and this is the systematic and the proactive um, steps that flow throughout the entire uh, customer experience. Um, in a recent study it was discovered that uh, a top brand loyalty driver is really how you make customers feel. It was a bigger driver than price and fees. Um, and that feeling was not happiness, um, but rather it was the feeling of being respected. And that requires empathy and not judgment, um, but also feelings of being appreciated and valued. Uh, and that was um, something that was driving uh, brand, brand loyalty. Um, yet, the study also found that it's also the most significant improvement area needed for um, banking institutions. Um, we're not doing very well um, in really tapping into and understanding our um, audience, our customers, and seeking to choose them in a way that's going to have that emotional tie and connection. And so we often uncover when guiding branding processes um, that there's really kind of varying degrees around how we feel we're doing as an organization and then really what that reality is of how customers actually feel. 
Um, so this was confirmed in another study where 80% of CEOs um, believe that their companies were delivering exceptional customer experiences, yet the same percentage of consumers don't believe that brands understand them as individuals at all. And uh, this imbalance is present for so many banking institutions because they may not be measuring and tracking loyalty um, or possibly it's not being weighted of equal importance um, based on other metrics that they're watching maybe more closely and loyalty um, measurements are being kind of pushed to the back burner. So what it, an organization tracks and what it measures or what it doesn't is really revealing about uh, what the organization values and matters most. Yeah, and I think, Karen, that's a, a great segue to say that, you know, we definitely wanted to build a brand that was differentiated. Uh, it came from the top, from the CEO that said it has to be different. It has to speak differently in our market. And when we built it, we really wanted to transcend, again, that idea of what a financial brand could be and make sure that it conveyed our lifestyle. And that front wave should be a place that gets me and the metrics show that it gets me. Um, we had, uh, I think the 2017 to 2020, that's 2017 is when I started here. But in that time, we've had 30% asset growth and near 30% loan growth and share growth. Uh, which has over, we've had increased over 200, uh, 200 million in assets during, uh, just before the brand and when we, and just last month. But year over year, we just looked, uh, it resulted in loyalty metrics. And we measure loyalty metrics a lot. Uh, just our net promoter score, for those of you familiar with that score, our relationship score increased 11%. In, a tw in our last 12 month span. Uh, our channels, it, uh, particularly call center digital service, at, and now that we're in COVID, digital is important. Uh, so we've had a big uh, importance on the digital channel, 10 to 20%, 10% in call center, 20% increase in digital. And at the end of the day, 13% more of our members now consider FrontWave their primary financial institution. And that's a number that is really key. And, it, and on top of that, not only do we measure our net promoter score, but we measure it to competitors in market with an annual survey. And the last survey just said that we were nearly 30, per, our front wave members were nearly 30% more happy at front wave than those that bank somewhere else. So, Keep, look at your metrics, make sure to measure and see how you're doing, how you're, if you're going on this journey, how is your brand performing? How is it helping the organization? So driving loyalty um, really begins with that brand resonance, but also need, in order to have that resonance, uncovering really what the needs of the customer are and then also fulfilling them consistently throughout the customer experience um, is a really critical um, step. And consumers really expect more and more personalization. Um, you know, companies and brands have lots of data and information about their customers. Um, banking institutions have perhaps more data than any other industry. And that personalization um, not only drive, drives the loyalty, but it's a high expectation really from their preferred brands of choice. So if I choose you, you know, certainly you must know some, you know, some things about me and then use that and how you tailor uh, messages um, to me. But banking institutions haven't done as good of a job as other industries and, um, and getting to really understand their customers beyond demographics and beyond simply what their product usage may be. So uncovering what your customers value and prize, um, knowing what their brand preferences, perhaps besides you, um, says about them. 
Um, also their shopping habits, um, all of these things really go to provide greater depth into who they are as individuals, which makes that customization and personalization of service and messaging to them even better and gaining greater brand resonance with them. Uh, but these insights come from leveraging your data analytics to improve their lives. Uh, but unfortunately, many financial institutions are, are behind on this. And uh, the analytics need to be integrated and pulled together somehow and accessible on a number of levels so that it can be optimized and put to use. Um, so Strum Platform, uh, this is one possibility of, of systems, but this is a cloud-based fintech platform and it gives access to that critical information and insights that are really necessary to serve customers extremely well. Um, knowing them so well that it helps build loyalty with those deeper customer and relationship insights um, that are exceedingly um, accessible from lots of different places uh, within the organization. And so digging into your data, knowing who your customer is, and then leveraging that data and the insights to personalize and tailor customer service experiences um, that are connected deeply with your values and your brand is what will help drive loyalty for organizations. And as Frontwave has discovered, that loyalty then also has very significant and real growth benefits for the organization. Okay, so uh, some takeaways for optimizing your brand uh, to be a high performer. Uh, number one, uh, to recap, invest in your culture. Uh, and, and remember that your, your staff are people and the people you serve are people. And they're all feeling something right now. Um, I, I, I've mentioned it twice probably, but coming back to that Maslow period, pyramid and think about that unsure footing, what does that mean and how do we rally? How do we be optimistic? How do we grow? Let's define those gaps between our values and our principles, um, work to address them, align it, be diligent, be pace, patient, but make the investment. Um, and, and really don't be afraid to lead with your values. Um, don't, don't be afraid to put those forward. Uh, two, define your purpose. Um, align that purpose with your niche and who you're doing business with and doing business for. Um, understand that, that it's about fulfilling need. So be brave. Use it as, a, as a, the center of your differentiation. Use it as a tool to differentiate. Uh, aim for those edges and, and just be an awesome storyteller. Third, engineer that brand for loyalty. Know that um, really effective branding, high functioning branding is about fulfilling need. So understanding ne those needs, those practical and emotional, the, what the demographics say, say, but also the psychographics tell us about, about a person, how they feel, how they think, how they respond to stress. Um, all of those things are really, really important and we gotta use that understanding and, and really, really, really super, super want to stress empathy um, as, as, as the secret to lots of really effective branding. Um, we've got to think about what their, those needs are and reflect it in the brand. And then be honest with yourself. Be focused on what your goals are. Stay focused on the goals, but be informed. Test yourself uh, and don't be afraid to like, you know, show yourself the truth. Yeah, I think right now for many financial institutions that we've been, you know, talking with are wondering, you know, is, is now the right time to re-engineer the brand, to make changes of any significance while there is so much unrest. And um, what we have discovered is that, you know, that now, is really um, the exact right time for organizations to reimagine and re-engineer um, their brand. Because during these times of disruption, you know, they can often be um, a catalyst for great innovation, creativity, new ways of thinking. And if you found yourself 
um, not on great footing with your brand when this crisis hit, I think that's a cue for the organization to reevaluate um, the relevancy of the brand. Because what was once a year ago, as you now cast that vision forward, may no longer be um, that North Star, that North Star or guiding principle um, that's going to increase that relevance and resonance with, um, with your customers that they now especially so deeply need and are looking for. Yeah, I think Karen, I would add one other thing to that is if, if, this, if the brand uncertainty piece of this is resonating with you, uh, I, I wouldn't wait, I'd start today. Um, it, it's a long process. So the earlier you start, the earlier, the quicker the jump you get. And I think uh, as Karen, Josh and I, we were talking the other day, we were reminded of those hotels uh, that renovated post 9-11. Uh, they were renovating their hotel space knowing that they'd be at less capacity right there post 9-11 during the downtime and, and when people weren't traveling. And those hotels, once people started traveling and they got to where they needed to be, they started flourishing once everybody started traveling again. So I think st if it feels familiar, I I'd tell you to start. Yeah, we might be in a brand moment right now. Yep. All right. Well, uh, we're gonna go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, feel free to uh, put your questions in. Uh, the, there's a Q&A button at the bottom um, and I will direct those to the, the, the group here. So um, give a moment for that and looks like we have, uh, we have one question so far. This, this for you, Todd. Um, so how did you convince the board to even begin this brand journey? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, it, it, it goes back to the 2016 uh, planning, strategic planning session where I had set up front that marketing and branding were found to be in an internal survey of all of, of our staff, our leadership team, our volunteers, executive team, that marketing and branding were two of the lowest uh, competencies that the credit union had. And so out of that came, hey, we need to research our brand. And so it really started just as a, hey, let's just do a research. And I can't harp on metrics and surveys and, and data and information more uh, as we had a, a little bit of a lack of it. And so we went out to market. Uh, we did internal, external research. Uh, we interviewed, surveyed all of our staff, all of our leaders, our volunteers. We went to market. Uh, we surveyed our members. We surveyed non-members in markets. Uh, and we just, we got a lot of data. We went through uh, workshops. We had, uh, we had not only front of the house people, back of the house uh, staff, uh, leadership, management, supervisor breakouts. We just captured as much data and competitive analysis as we could. We went through our own data and analysis and really it all culminated in a, a three hour Saturday afternoon, board executive team, volunteers, 19 of us, and we just presented the data. And I'm telling you, we had board members that have 40 plus years uh, tenure on the board, ex-Marines who came in that Saturday afternoon pounding on the desk, we will never take core or Marine out of the name. And by the end of three hours, we just asked, okay, give us your feedback. And the first bit of feedback was the data is overwhelming. And that set the stage. And that really led us uh, to making the really difficult decision of changing our name, uh, but leaning into our history, leaning into being open to the community, and then putting the board 
on our project teams as we went through the process of renaming and rebranding, I think really helped us a lot. Awesome, Todd. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question here. I'm going to direct it to Josh, but he might uh, get some help from Todd on this one too. Is what is a good way to approach the old guard at the CU about getting into the feel the knot in your stomach approach? Some CU people are too comfortable doing what they've always done. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, a, a good question for sure. The, the, um, he, he, here's the problem with us human beings, right? We like comfort and we like things to be easy. We're all drawn to that. Um, certainly I'm drawn to that. I, I think um, what there's a, a, there is a direct correlation between that knot in your stomach and whether or not you're changing and growing. And getting used to working with that knot and and using it as a sign that something maybe is positive as opposed to something negative. I mean, obviously, if your instincts are telling you don't, that's a, that's a different thing. But if you're nervous about the change or maybe failing, that's probably good. That's probably healthy. And I believe that it's a skill you can learn. Now, if there's a uh, a, uh, an aversion to change. Well, then you can't really do too much about that. I mean, I think number one is to get people to realize that we can't stay, if, if the path we're on uh, is not tenable or will burn itself out, it doesn't have room to grow and adapt, then change is a requirement. And in order to have good effective change that leads to innovation and maybe surprises people, that comes with some nerves. And so getting used to trusting those nerves and trusting that it's going to be okay, um, which comes from a, a bit of experience. And I think, you know, with Todd's team, they certainly had some of that. Um, you know, they certainly had some of that. But they could also see the metrics of the performance. They could also see the writing on the wall. And so you have to present um, a vision and a path forward that makes them feel okay. Uh, because it, it it adjusts some of the things that they needed about you know respecting that history and not losing it and so on, um, but I think it's I think a little bit of is a learn of it of it is a learned skill, and you just have to decide to do it. Thanks, thanks, Josh. Um, so I'm going to direct this one at you, Tad. Uh, how how do you gain organizational alignment in this process? Yeah, that uh, yet yeah, another great question, and I think it goes back to the last uh, the last question I answered. I, I think the more and a little bit to what Josh just said, I, I think it's all about inclusivity and inclusion. I'm a big believer in transparency. I'm also a big believer in the team. Um, you know, I've rebranded several companies. And I can tell you that the one thing that is constant is that that company's been there a lot longer than I have. And so when you, when you delve into the history and the, the purpose and the culture and its people and your customers and your market, and you're, you're doing all that while at the same time you're including everyone because uh, you know, the quotes attributed to tons of people, but, um, you know, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. When we had our brand team, so like I told you, on our naming team, we had three members of the board on our naming team. On our brand team, it was the entire executive group uh, plus multiple people from our, what we call our deliver solutions team, but people that are actually enabling solutions, delivering solutions on the front lines that are helping manage our day-to-day -day business. Uh, we had managers and supervisors in a room together. We had front office and back office uh, folks in a room together, literally going through who are we, what are we, if we were a car, what kind of car are we? Um, are we female? Are we male? You know, and you're doing workshops and exercises. And I think getting people in in the beginning really helps. And then I've done this multiple times with the help of Karen and, and their group. 
I really believe in having brand camps prior to launch to where every single person in the organization goes through about a three hour brand camp and we do it together in multiple sessions that's cross-functional and we're learning about ourselves, the brand, who we are, why, the purpose, mission, vision, values, how does it change what I do? And uh, you walk away with what we call a brand card and it has our brand purpose uh, on one side and on the other it's blank with lines and you're supposed to write out what it is you're going to do every day to make sure that you're keeping the brand alive and that you are presenting the brand in the way in which we want it uh, presented. That's who we are. And I think all of that, it's inclusivity, it's including everyone and making sure that everybody feels like it's theirs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well put Todd. And you know, um, branding and culture can't be separated. I mean, they are so tightly intertwined that diving in and understanding the culture of an organization, what makes it tick, what is um, held of great importance, what's valued, um, are all major stepping stones for identifying what an organization's purpose is. And then ultimately in helping build that ownership um, and accountability then to the brand in those day-to-day -day actions moving forward. All right, great. Uh, well, we have one more question. Um, I'll, I'll ask you this, Todd, and these guys can jump in, but uh, what opportunities or uh, initiatives are you most excited about for 2021? Yeah, I see that's a plant. Uh, we, 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 have a, we have an internal plant, but yeah, uh, great question, Justin. Um, <laughs> you know, it's really about the next, le the next level of uh, oper the next operational level of operationalizing the brand. Um, you know, I think we're, we're, we're embarking on deeper sales training, deeper sales understanding, role playing, uh, so that we can, because we are transitioning, we were very much transactional oriented as we continue our transition to uh, being known for the value uh, that we bring in making uh, financial dreams come true, fighting for our members every day uh, to help them with their goals. And, and get and get to be known for consultation and advice. I think from the marketing side of things, um, it's really fun because now the building blocks are there to take all the things that we've learned from segmentation strategy, uh, our product strategy, sales strategy, molding all those together to now start to aut automate uh, onboarding, digital automation, triggers, BI and analytics. So. To, to us, I think that's that next level of uh, operationalizing the brand with our purpose, really the driving force. That sounds like, that sounds pretty exciting. So this, uh, thank you so much. This concludes our webinar. I really appreciate uh, the panelists spending some time, especially Todd. Thank you so much for your time today. And if you did ask a question or if you have any other questions that you wanted to ask, please uh, do feel free to email me. It should be on your registration email and I will get back to you. But thank you so much for your time today. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone.